May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be holy and acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, welcome. So glad we're all here this morning on this rally day. So good to see those of you that chose to come in your jerseys or repping your team. I appreciate that. Um, you know, I feel like it's a pastoral responsibility uh, to remain neutral in those things. Politics and sports, you know. So, uh, oh, excuse me, I forgot to do this. Excuse me, I gotta, I gotta do the... So I just, I don't believe in, in you know, spouting any team, uh, in particular for, for pastoral reasons. Um, oh, excuse me, I forgot this as well. Stampede, go you Dallas Cowboys, go. For those of you who didn't know, that was Hank Hill from King of the Hill singing Stampede to the Dallas Cowboys. You know, I should take this down. Some of you aren't even going to listen to the sermon if that's still up there. <laughs> I am a Dallas Cowboys fan. I'll be the first to tell you. I am not a mega fan. I rely on my little brother to help me understand the lowdown on the players and the plays and the details of the game. I just love watching the Cowboys play. It's a part of my Sunday liturgy this time of year. And I know, I get it, I do. The Dallas Cowboys are an easy team to dislike because, because of what comes attached to them. Jerry Jones and the opulence of Jerry World, I get it, right? I get it. And there's times when I've told people I'm a Cowboys fan and they're like, oh, well, you must love Jerry Jones. And that doesn't make any sense to me. That's kind of like the same thing as telling somebody you like chicken fried steak and then be like, oh, you must love fatty heart disease. You know, just you can be a fan of something and not like the sickness attached to it, right? I love to watch the Dallas Cowboys because it reminds me of being a kid. It was on TV pretty much every Sunday. And whether we were celebrating Thanksgiving in Dallas or in Odessa, Texas, the Cowboys game was on. So it reminds me of the family, many of whom are no longer with us, that gathered around that game. It connects me, in a way, to family and friends in lots of places, Dallas and Abilene and Austin and, and San Angelo and Sweetwater and Colorado City and Lubbock and Santa Fe and even in Indiana where I have some family, on and on and on. They're all watching the game with me. And I love that every Monday morning when I arrive in the office here and I see Marlon Gibbons, the first thing we're going to talk about are the Cowboys. Plus, it's not like the Dallas Cowboys are the only professional sports team to suffer from ego inflation. That goes with the territory in competitive sports. It's a whole enterprise built on boasting in their money, boasting in their abilities, boasting in their players, their program, boasting in their strength. Which is why I find our collect this morning kind of fun and ironic and rather intriguing juxtaposed alongside our sports-themed rally day. Let's hear the words of that collect again. It's on the very first page of your bulletin. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts, for as you always resist the proud who confide in their own strength, so you never forsake those who make their boast of your mercy. This is an old prayer, ancient even. Some scholars believe it to be penned from the hand of Pope Leo, stretching all the way back to the fifth century. Its inspiration, its root, is from the fourth chapter of James's pastoral letter in the New Testament. In that section, James is addressing conflict going on inside the church and he's improvising off the Proverbs, the wisdom literature of Israel, 
when he writes, God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. It's the old pastor reminding the followers of Christ then and these many centuries later to make our boast in God's mercy. But what does that even mean, to boast in God's mercy? Before we move that direction, why don't we consider what it might look like to do what we're encouraged not to do, which is confide, as the collect reads, in our own strength. See, confide doesn't just mean to trust. It means to intimately trust. There is a deep, abiding relationship present when you confide. That word came from those Highland Scots many years ago when they borrowed it from the Latin confidere, meaning to deeply trust or entrust to another. So when you and I confide in our own strength, what we are communicating on some level in some way is that what we find the most dependable, what we find the most reliable, the most inerrant, what we most intimately trust without pause or without question is our own self. Just me. I'm good. I got this. I don't need anything or anybody else. And we become always the hero of our own story. The only problem is that doesn't last. In his youth, the poet David White was hiking in the Himalayas when he came to a deep chasm. The only way across that chasm was this rickety old rope bridge with many missing slats. Although he was a confident, experienced mountaineer, he suddenly froze at the prospect of traversing the abyss on so treacherous a path. He sat down on the ground and stared at the bridge for hours, stuck, unable to proceed, not knowing what to do. There are times when the hero has to sit down, he said later. At some bridges in life, the part of you that always gets it done has to sit down. Then an old Tibetan woman came along, gathering yak dung for fuel. She walked with a limp. Namaste, she said with a smile. Then she turned and limped across the bridge without giving it a second thought. Immediately, without thinking, David White rose and followed her. Sometimes he realized it is the unheroic, limping, unequipped part of ourselves that gets us to the other side. We can't always confide in our own strength. We need to confide in something else. The collect opens with a kind of bidding. Grant us, O Lord, to trust in you with all our hearts. Maybe especially the unheroic, limping, unequipped parts of our hearts that are scared to trust. But just because we're scared to trust doesn't mean we can't. Whoever said trust wasn't going to be scary. Of course it's scary. Of course it is. Because it takes something scary like trust to drive out the fear in our lives. Trusting our hearts to God doesn't mean those hearts will never break. It just means they don't have to break apart. We can't confide in our own strength but we can learn to trust God with our hearts. And then I think we'll begin to see something. I think we begin to see that there's been this thing at work in our lives all along from the very beginning, even in the hard times, even through the difficulty, it's been there and we haven't always seen it and we haven't always paid attention to it and we sure haven't always named it, but it's been there. Mercy, mercy, time and time again. 
You know what might be something for you to do today? While we're all walking around out there eating food and laughing and telling stories and listening to good music and learning about all the different ministries within the church, you know what might be something to do? Is just, you know, stop for a second and look around and imagine something. See, imagine all those people a long time ago in 1891 when they started St. Andrew's Church. I'm not entirely sure who all those people were, and you don't have to know who they were either, but you can imagine how they looked. They all kind of seem the same in those old black and white photographs, right? Nobody's smiling. Of course they weren't. Back then, you could only afford a photograph every five years from some guy who hid underneath his jacket, pulled a string, and then ignited some explosion of light and smoke right in front of your face. It's a lot to risk to put it on a goofy smile, right? No, they, they didn't do that. They all just looked straight ahead, unblinking, resolute. It's like they were looking into the future. That's why when you look at their faces in those old pictures, you can feel them looking at you. But just imagine them for a second, and all the years that have passed between then and now, all the events in the life of our world, our country, our state, our community, this church, imagine all of that, all the hard times, all the difficult times, all the people, the personalities, all the times it could have gone sideways, all the times it almost did go sideways, over and over again, just imagine that, and then just look around at what's going on in front of you. At who's in front of you. And that you get to be here. That we all get to be a part of this. Isn't that something? You could do that. And you might not marvel in it. You might just shrug your shoulders and go on about your day. Or you might, if you let yourself be taken by something... You might see that the whole thing is just one mercy after another after another. What are those words from Lamentations? We hear them sometimes at funerals. How does that go? The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness, O God. Great is thy faithfulness. We do not confide in our own strength today. We do not puff out our chests. We do not attempt any stupid end zone dances to say how awesome our church is. No, today we get to celebrate. We get to laugh together. We get to connect with one another. We get to discover ministries that are going on within the church, all of that. And we do get to boast. And we get to boast boldly. But we make our boast of God's mercy. Amen.